had some internet issues before and network issues and it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. Right, so the Neopod link is here for 7GIB. All right, we're going to work our way through this. Now, if I run out of power the app, I've got another backup that I will use. And it. So 47 GIB is the code. All right, where we last left off, we were discussing perfectly competitive firms. I might have to. Right. Try the third time. I, I don't like answering the phone. <laughs> I really don't. Well. Really. Um, uh, mainly, I don't like talking on the phone. Right, that's part of being an introvert. Is you don't like that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, also, quite often people don't understand me. I right. thought. Hello, David Smith. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm at work. Can you can you leave at the guardhouse? Thank you. Trying to explain to people where we live, I, I struggle with. Uh, my accent doesn't work particularly well down the telephone. And have had issues in China, obviously, with people trying to talk to me on the phone, um, and in Thailand. So sometimes I'll just hand the phone to somebody else to you. Can, you can. Right. We remember that perfectly competitive firms, they're going to be on that extreme end of the spectrum. They're the ones that we're going to use as a basis for comparison. So we're going to be judging all other businesses on the basis of how close they are to a perfectly competitive firm. Which means that the government is then going to use those features right, as a guide. They're going to look at those features and say, well, quite clearly it's not perfect because this particular feature doesn't work in this particular business. It's also going to give us clues as to what the government could do if they want to push you towards perfect competition. Again, look at the features. So government policies could be to do with entry and exit. Government policies could be to do with information. Yeah? All of those sorts of things. The homogeneity of products could be you know, rules and regulations about what the product is and how it's made. Yeah? They can make it more homogenous. So that's the sort of clues that we can use. Right, and we've discussed perfect information a lot of time now, a lot of the time before. All right. We have said that it is impossible in our current market situation to have this idea of perfect knowledge. You can't have it. You can try. There will be some products where you've got more information than other products. Yes, but it's also from the business's point of view. 
Yeah, and that's something that we need to also, also, I'm adding the word also as a redundancy, right? To understand that the business has to understand you, right? So your utility levels, your satisfaction levels, how much you personally are prepared to pay. What if you were prepared to pay more? Yeah, well, they don't know that. What if you're secretly an expert in this particular product and you know that you're getting a better deal for it than what they're, you know? Oh, can I, can I give you an honesty test? Oh, here we go. This will test you. All right, ethics. Have any of you been in this situation? And I've been in it more than once. All right, you've been buying something either at a shop, supermarket, somewhere, and they've been doing the registering, they've been putting the item through, the numbers have been coming up, you've been keeping a mental check, because you do, all right? And then you notice that something's not right. But what is not right is actually in your favor. Yeah? They have miscounted something, all right? And all of a sudden, you're better off. Do you voluntarily give them the extra money that you know you didn't have to because they didn't yeah, charge you for it? Or do you keep quiet and go, woohoo, score? Yeah. Good point. I've I've personally had it several times, more than once. Okay, and usually it's in the sort of like uh, sometimes department stores, right, where people are bringing things up and there's lots of items and that yeah and they'll make a mistake with the calculations. And then it's like you're standing there going, well, I've done the maths in my head, and they've actually undercharged me for this shopping. Do I tell them? It's about perfect information. In theory, they should just know. But now you have knowledge they don't. So how do you choose to use that? What are the ethics of that? Are you stealing? The TOK question, yeah? Now, I have actually given money to them, right? When that has occurred with me, because I have spotted it and I've said, well, look, I've been in the, the reverse situation, right? I've been the person behind the counter, yeah? So I know what that is and I know what happens if their till comes up short, yeah? Right. I've also been, as said, in that reverse situation. I remember it quite vividly. I'm in the supermarket, and I'm ringing the, the customer's groceries through, and then I'm, you have to do a separate for the amount that it costs, right, into the payment system, and then it comes off their card. So it's a different system back then it was. Yeah, I think it was a check, in fact. Right, back in those days, yes, I'm that old. Right, you know what a check is? Yeah, still some people who know what checks are. It's amazing. So I typed the numbers wrong because, yeah, me be good at maths, yeah, in England, right? And I'd gotten two of the numbers around the wrong way, which meant effectively that she had saved herself 50 New Zealand dollars worth of groceries, which again times it by four to get Malaysian ringgit to work out how much she'd actually saved. Which is a pretty good deal, all right? Now, she'd left, gone. I don't know whether she'd worked out that she'd gotten that deal or not, but after I put the check into the drawer, I found myself staring at the, 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 the till going, Wait a minute, something not right here. And then I opened the tool drawer again and had a look at the check and said, oh, 
I may have added a couple more words now and put it back away. Okay. <laughs> Something to tell the manager. All right. All right. Okay. So in real life, as we've discussed and we've looked at this with behavioral economics as well, information isn't there. You don't have all the information. Consumers don't have it. Producers don't have it. So there is a big gap with this. But governments can help. They can, and we know that. The governments can make you put all the ingredients on the, on the can, yeah? But they don't put on the side how many you're allowed to drink. They do on the New Zealand version. Warning, only drink a maximum of this many per day which, yes, for some New Zealand students became a bit of a target. Right, let's see if we can do more. Yeah? We do have asymmetric information, so governments can try and fix that. We know about barriers to entry. We know that businesses all the time can be prevented from doing what they want to do. But if it's perfect, there's no barrier. So anybody can set up a business and... There are actual statistical studies that look at how easy it is to start up a business in any particular country. All right? And those of you who might be doing business as well, that's something you can look at too. And they print, they used, used to print them every year, I don't know if they still do. All right? They pop up on my Facebook right? and my LinkedIn feed. So barriers to entry don't happen in perfect competition. So businesses are free to enter or leave. Right? So in the theory, in the model then, what it's going to mean is that businesses will come in if they can see that they're going to make a profit and then they're going to leave if they think they're going to make a loss. Yeah? And that's going to become quite important later on. Right? It means that if any particular firm is making a profit, it's it's like, uh, you know, uh, any of you gone feeding sharks? No? If I use the expression chum in the water, you understand what I refer to? Yeah. Yeah? It's like um, having a bag of M&Ms and throwing the, the M&Ms up into the air into a crowd of hungry year sevens. All of a sudden, chaos erupts. Yeah? If Giraffe's firm is making a profit, yeah, everybody sees, everybody wants it. So they join. And by doing so, they're going to eat away any profit he was earning. And similarly, if he's making a loss, why bother staying? There we go. It doesn't cost you to leave, just as it doesn't cost you to start. Right? And again, this is where New Zealand leaders go, oh, but there's nothing like that in reality. Why are we learning? Yeah. It's a litmus test for other businesses. You're able to judge the degrees of barriers to entry, you're able as a government to try to minimize those barriers to promote competition. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I understand the word eaten away, that, that's what's throwing you, isn't it? Uh, my editorializing there, apologies. Um, I keep coming back to eaten away. Uh, yeah, you can. In an exam, yes. Don't use it in your IA. Right. Um, not that you're going to. Right. Uh, and don't use it in an EE. But in an exam, you can. Absolutely. 
You can editorialize more in an exam because it's under the time pressure and it's not structured and sitting and things like that. Right, we talked about homogeneity of products. There is no difference between them. None. If they are perfectly competitive, then the products are identical. I have an issue with twins. I can't tell the difference between twins. I don't know if you can, if you know twins. Anybody know twins? Yeah? A lot of you. Okay. I, 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 yeah? I've taught so many twins over the years. This is the first school that I've been at that I haven't taught a twin yet. Not to my knowledge, in any way. I, use, I usually have twins in the same class. And they're usually identical twins at that. They are as homogenous as homogenousness. Yeah? Right? The first set of twins I taught at the school in New Zealand, I couldn't tell them apart. And they used to do the game where one of them would turn up and you'd have to try and guess which one it was. Is that good? Yeah. My boss at the time, uh, she used to tell me she could tell the two apart because apparently one of them had longer eyelashes than the other. I said to her, I'm really not going to be looking that closely. Yeah. She can. Had a large number of Russian identical twins in uh, Thailand. Maybe Russia doesn't like twins and they kick them out of the country. I don't know. Or maybe twins are considered evil. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, any of you left handed? Have I told you this story? Left handed people? I told you the left-handed story. No? no? All right. Okay. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? A long time ago, people used to think people who were left-handed were evil. All right? They did. Okay? And people who were left-handed were actively discriminated against. I'm not kidding you. Yeah, yeah. Right, so when you'd come to school, if you were to attempt to use your left hand, the teacher would smack your hand with a ruler, right, and you'd get into trouble and you'd, they'd force you to use your right hand. Right? Do you know why? Why did we think left handed people were evil? By the way, Adolf Hitler was left handed, just saying, and a vegetarian. Right, just saying. <laughs> no, it's a vegetarian. Just saying. No, because here's the assumption, right? And this was actually believed that you had twins, right? And one of the twins would be right-handed and the other would be left because there'd be a mirror image of each other. Yeah, that's what people believed. So therefore, when the, when the babies were becoming people, the left-handed baby would absorb the right-handed baby killing it and therefore it was the evil one that's where that came from yeah all right So if it is perfectly competitive, the products are homogenous, they are identical, there is no difference between them. From an economics language point of view, one of the phrases we use is that they're not differentiated. 
Okay, we like that. We use big long words. Yeah. All right. Instead of saying there is no difference, we say they're not differentiated, which allows us to talk about other goods and say those goods are differentiated. Yeah. So that's what that all is. If they are differentiated, that means and they can be different. But understand that if you're able to differentiate your product even slightly in a perfectly competitive environment, that means you've got a competitive advantage. Yeah? So any slight difference, any slight variation on a theme gives you that advantage. And you all know this because you all do this. This is part of you. Yeah? You're all thinking to yourself, I want to get into this university and that university and I want to do this. And I, yeah? So the way I'm going to do that is to differentiate myself from everybody else. Yeah? Because as you're all aware, when you get out of the school environment, all of a sudden you're in a much bigger pool and everybody has done the same things as you. So if you've done something different, you stand out. Yeah? Right. Okay, so what is a homogenous product? Can you think of any possible examples? There actually are some that are very close. But have a go. Can I ask? You and Big Sister? People get you too confused? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. They're like, are you good? Yeah. Right. One of the best, well, one of the basketball teams I, I had, I coached in New Zealand, had identical twin guys in the team. And it was brilliant because the refs could never figure out which one was which. Even with the numbers on the back and everything, it was like, yeah. So we were able to share the foul count amongst yeah, them yeah. quite nicely. They're all about your size too, all right? Giant that you are, yeah. Uh, and they were thirteen. Um, I can't remember their names now. It was a long time ago, uh, but it was very funny. Some people think it was quite early. Yeah. Some people early. Because I see some friends now yeah. having it. And yeah. I know it's like a big. Right. Now we're getting on. Oh, we got something in it. Oh, good idea. Well done. Not a big wine connoisseur myself, but. You heard her say phones as well, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was thinking, why are these shops selling bones? I, I don't. But yes, phones. Um, yeah. So in yeah, yes, you're right. There could be a lot of that with the homogeneity of the individual products. Yes, um, you could make that as an argument. But it's also about, and because this is something that the textbooks and stuff will tell you now, it's also not about. Strictly speaking, the physical goods, as it might be the services that come with the goods. 
as well. So that can be something that gets added to it. Or it can just, strictly speaking, be the service itself. How homogenous is your internet service provider, for example? Yeah. Right, okay. Now, it's time for everybody's favorite board game, Monopoly. Every time I see the word, I want to say do, 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 do after it. All right? You know why, eh? No? Okay. Um, there's a, uh, there was a TV show, a children's TV show, many, 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 many years ago called The Muppets. It wasn't the US House of Representatives, right? Um, it was a, a they, they were puppets, right? The, the name came from you get a puppet and you put a, a mop on its head and it's a muppet. Yeah? Okay? And they, they were very popular at the time. And one of the things that they did, the Muppets, was they had a song. They did lots of singing. And the Muppets did a song and it was something along the lines of Mana Mana. That one. That's a Muppet song. Right? Yes. Yes, he was in one of them. Yes, right. Um, and I used to. Excuse me. Um, I used to use that because it's a um, syllabalistic music. Yeah. So Monopoly. Yeah. And when I was in the supermarket, it was potato chip. So I'd sit there. Yeah. Monopoly. What we do. So, at the other extreme, so you had perfectly competitive firms. So now you're going to have a perfectly in, in, perfectly uncompetitive firm. Yeah. A monopolist. Mono meaning one. Right? So they're like the pirates of the business world. There's just one parrot. Monopoly. Right, okay. Because there's just one business, they're the only ones producing the product, they can set the price. Right, you know we talked about perfectly competitive firms having to take the price that the market set. Well, this is one firm that is the market. Yeah. So, yeah, in theory they have to take the price that the market sets, but they are the market. So they set the price. They can also set the quantity. You have to be a bit careful with that. I made a joke about iris setters. Did you see that? And you were looking at me like, what's an iris setter? Nobody knows what a iris setter is. Yes. My my jokes about animals that always annoy animal lovers. Have I told you those? Yeah, was that from like from year eleven or was that from year eleven? No animal lovers in the room. These are these are jokes, all right? Not serious suggestions at all. Just the same. Yeah. How do you make a cat go woof? Take it outside, pour petrol over it, light it with a match. Woof. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. How do you make a dog go meow? Put it in a freezer for three days, take it outside, put it across a bandsaw. Meow. <laughs> That's so smart. Yeah. 
Now, they aren't my jokes per se. They're from a 1970, 1980 comedian, stand-up comedian, a gentleman called George Similovich. He's the same guy who came up with the I'm so tough jokes, right, which were, uh, I'm so tough that my girlfriend irons my shirts while I'm wearing them. Um, I'm so tough that my mother tucks me into bed. She doesn't tuck me into bed, she staples me in. Um, I'm so tough that my um, Cocoa Pops don't go snack, crackle and pop. They go, Shh, here he comes. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. They've got the market power, but what you need to be careful about is that they can't control two things at once. They're either going to be able to control the quantity, or they're able to control the price. They can't do both. Yeah, because a lot of the quantity has to do with us. Yeah. Okay. So if they're trying to control the quantity, then the price gets set by the demand. If they're trying to control the price, then they've got no control over the quantity because the quantity is then set by the demand. They want, like, very expensive cars. Yes. Like, like, they want to make it very expensive That's why every day I drive home in a $500,000 car. Um, you might suggest there are subtle differences between Maseratis and Ladas, or Maseratis and Toyotas. Yeah? So, again, it's that idea that if there is even a small difference, then you're able to exploit that difference. Yeah. And you can create an entire new market. Yeah. So Bugatti, uh, which released another new car not that long ago, and it's now the fastest car ever. Yeah. Bugatti hand builds their cars. I don't think there's any other company in the world that actually hand builds their cars. All right. Now, the monopolist is going to see that the substitution effect is not present with the monopolist because there's only one of them. You either buy it or you don't. That's it. But is there a pure monopoly? What do you think of, it might be the difference between a monopolist and a pure monopolist? Yeah. Yes. You are absolutely on the right path. Well done. Yes. Right. Uh, it's theory, remember? Yeah. So real life isn't going to exactly match this. Right? And again, this can be where you have that idea, this is the extreme end here, monopolists. So what I tell students, particularly the ones in New Zealand who are dragging their knuckles, right, is that we're realistically talking about monopolistic behaviours. Yeah? That's what we're more likely to be talking about, particularly the government. Right? Because you're right, yeah? There are lots of firms that potentially could do the same things. But there are going to be some that are exactly as the theory says. And if they meet the theory exactly, then we're going to classify them as pure monopolists. But only if they meet it exactly. We are going to look at that. It's a slight subsection. Yeah, right. It's got a slightly different model, right. 
and there are some slight differences that you will see. But a pure monopolist is going to be one that matches the theory exactly. We're going to be able to talk about firms that approach a monopoly. We're going to be able to talk about businesses that behave like a monopoly. Which means it's their behavior. It's not that they are a monopoly. It's perhaps that their behavior is. With that being said, what do they look like? Well, here we go. Here's some key characteristics. This is how they might behave. All right. There's one of them. They have a unique product. All right. That's the one that you don't see because it uniques up on you. There are no close substitutes to this particular product. It is not, it's it's a hundred percent differentiated. Right? That's the idea. Remember, this is the theory. Right? They're able to set the prices and there are going to be barriers to entry. There are potentially big ones. Right? So things along the lines of economic barriers to entry. We're going to look at those in legal barriers to entry. We're going to look at some of those. Panic and technical barriers to entry. Again, don't panic. Now, are you aware of a country called the United Kingdom? It exists, it does still, kind of. Yeah? If you went back to history a long, long time ago, in another galaxy far, far away, you would find some very big businesses operating out of the United Kingdom. Very big. Some of the biggest businesses in the history of the world have actually operated out of the United Kingdom right, for a long time. In fact, have I told you this before? One of the biggest businesses in the history of the world operated out of the United Kingdom, and it was so big that the British government gave it the right when it landed in another country to set up shop, it was allowed by the British government, yeah, to grab a whole lot of the people who lived there and force them to work for its company. All right? It was also allowed to represent the British government as a business. All right? As long as it fought in wars that British want, the British wanted it to. It was technically allowed to go to another country, get this, this is a business, this is like Microsoft, yeah? This business was allowed to go to another country and put a British flag in that country and say this country is now British. Backed by the British government. Never heard of the company, have you? Well done, good sir. You've possibly seen it because there are now clothing retailers with the same name. Nice. East India. It was also able to issue its own currency. Yeah. It was allowed to offer the people, right, the opportunity to become British citizens by itself as a business. Can you imagine that? There's Nexus. All right. We're going to Singapore. Now you're all Malaysian. Well done. Don't like it? Tough. Yeah. You have to wear the Nexus colors, though. Yes. Yes. Well, not necessarily allow. It's about how easy it is. So if it is legal barriers, for example, then it's what the government has set. Yeah? So laws, regulations. Uh, that's, that's why I was talking about Britain. Um, Britain, if you go back long enough, that they had this thing called a, a king and a queen. 
I still have it. Yeah. Last I checked. Yeah. She's in her nineties. Come on. No. Okay. Hold on. All right. Now, a long time ago, what you used to do is you would, if you wanted to set up business, you would petition the king or the queen to set up business. And then the king or the queen would give you the royal seal of approval, which meant you were the only one allowed to do that business. That's it. You were the official tailor. Yeah? You were the official fisher person because it was the government's job to say who did those jobs. And the government was the king or queen. So in essence, in some of those times, the governments of the day were setting up monopolies. Does that happen today? Interesting. Right, and there are technical. When we say technical, I know it's an old-fashioned word now, but what are we meaning? Technical. Okay. It is an old-fashioned word. I get older every day. I really do. It's quite scary. The only plus side is certain my sisters. <laughs> they don't want to know. They're not. Now, here's the thing. When we say technical, that's what we write in the textbooks. What we're actually meaning is No. But that's what we're meaning. Technology is what we're meaning. Right, so the first company to come up with the personal computer, the first company to come up with the, yeah, the technology of the day. Yeah, you think about the 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 what is it? The ballpoint pen. Yeah, one company owned the right to that product. Yeah, and the pens were really expensive to get. Until their right, their legal right, until that right disappeared, all right, because over time it did, and then all of a sudden everybody went whoosh and does it now. But it could be something that you've got the technology, you've figured out how to do something, and nobody else has figured it out yet. Yeah, I don't know about you, but the YouTube video of the Boston Dynamics dancing robots is a little freaky. But they've figured out that technology, they know how to do it. There isn't any other company that's done that. In fact, I think Boston Dynamics has just been bought by another company. Which makes it even more worrying. Right, so let's have a look a little bit closer. Two features of Monopolis. Go.
They are the one that form the barrier, or like they advocate for the barrier. They can do, yes. Yeah. Um, and if you go to, again, mythical countries like America, you'll see it happening all the time. You'll see the businesses actively lobbying the government to create barriers for other businesses. It's like a pattern of the barriers. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Trademarks, copyrights, all of that. Absolutely. Yes. Depends where you put it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but if you put it as the title to the figure, no. Yes. <laughs> that me. All of a sudden, it was like everybody's on the loose. What's going on? It's like a New Zealand high school. I need to get in the corner. My gun. It's all right, Donay will protect me. It's got the strength of 10 people. He's hiding. He's hiding. He's scared. He swam. Is that true? When, how are you hiding? I'm <laughs> here. Yes, yes, she's in quarantine now. Right, now, dum, dum, dum. remember I talked about how there were pure monopolies and they're not. And it's about the behavior of the business, okay? So you can have a local monopoly. Yeah, yeah. all right, it is possible to have a government controlled monopoly. Yeah, but quite often what we're talking about is the business's behavior and how their practices will limit other businesses from potentially entering that market. And then the government gets a bit upset. But sometimes the government is perfectly happy with the monopoly, particularly if they're the ones controlling it. For example, how many businesses control the toll roads around here? One, two, mm. at most two. That doesn't seem to be particularly competitive, does it? The high-speed rail that was going to be built between Malaysia and Singapore, how many businesses were going to be building it? One. Doesn't sound particularly competitive. But if the government, because he waited very gentlemanly and then needed to. All right. All right. So it is possible. So all you need to consider is just how is the business behaving? Right? Is it the government that set the monopoly up? Right? So let's take uh, another example. Again, I. I lived in a country called China for three years. All right? I was a much younger man. Okay? All right? Now, here's a question I found myself asking. How many businesses in China are there in concrete manufacturing? You... Right, making the concrete that goes in the buildings and the pavements and, yeah. Because if you haven't been to China, there's a lot of concrete. It's everywhere. Sorry, flashback to Universal Soldier. Right? Okay. There is 
concrete everywhere. So how many businesses do you think there are in China manufacturing concrete? One. Right? At the very least, in the entire province that we were in, one. So, here's a question for you. How did they get the job? The government decided. Yeah. The government said, we need a company to handle concrete. Look around the room. Joel, you want to do this? Joel said, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Here's your company. The entire concrete industry. Can you imagine how much money that's worth? In a country that's that big with that much concrete. Yeah? That's a lot of money. So, yes, you will find governments who say, yeah, we're perfectly happy to have a monopoly. Right, there's another country that's not too far from China, Russia. And in that particular country, it was quite well known, at least it was a while back now, maybe it's different, where people would just say, hey, mate, I'd like to run the entire fishing industry. Here you go. I'd like to run all of the telecommunications. Here you go. Because you were a mate of the person in charge. And so therefore, yeah, like the king of old, you would deal it out. Yeah? Like the king Donald Trump wants to be, you would just issue favors and pardons and presidential medals of freedom to weird politicians. Yeah? Devin Nunes. Presidential Medal of Freedom. Why? Because he defended Donald Trump in the Russia investigation. Okay. Now, much like the movie Blade, we need to be worried about vampires. No. We need to consider barriers to entry. Sorry, Winhow just sent me a message. Ah, yes. Yes, you're right, Winhouse. State-owned enterprises in China are usually monopolies, like China, China Petroleum. Absolutely. In fact, if you have a look at some of the biggest banks in the world, they're also all Chinese. Because they're run by the state, so therefore they are monopolies to a large extent. Now, uh, this was in the textbook. This is an idea to how to remember. What is that? Mnemonic? Is that the phrase? Yes. Or psychotic one of the people. How to remember the barriers to entry? Well, there is branding, brand awareness. We all know Apple. Everybody knows Apple. Not everybody knows wow, 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 wow. Even fewer people know Red. There is a cell phone company called Red. Right? Oh, I don't know, possibly. <laughs> Yeah. And there are possibly others out there that I don't know. But your brand makes you powerful. In fact, it makes you so powerful that sometimes your brand can actually be worth more money than your business. And business students in the room will probably become very aware of that when they are studying business accounts. Right? And then they will be looking at how businesses pay for other businesses. Yeah? When you buy another business, one of the things that you buy is their brand. And in their accounts, they actually write how expensive that will be. And you can look these up. They're, they're free. You, it's you know, online. The most expensive brands in the world. Now, they're quite obvious as to which ones they are. And I've already mentioned Apple. Yeah? But there are others, like the Walmarts of the world, okay? That is a brand, McDonald's, my word. Do you know how significant McDonald's is as a brand? 
Have I told you this before? No? You know the golden arches? Yeah? Well, believe it or not, in one particular country in the world, Shelf, we won't mention it, America, right? One of the first letters of the alphabet children learn is the letter M. Because McDonald's. Yeah? The branding is amazingly pervasive. And your awareness of it makes you potentially an avid consumer, etc. Therefore, you're more likely to buy from them. It then becomes a barrier because you're unknown. Yeah? Anti competitive practices. Lots of businesses do this. Of course, they do. All right. Yes, in your TOK classes, you can probably debate the ethics of it. In your business classes, you can debate the ethics of it. You can write IAs about the ethics, I guess. I don't know if you used to be able to. Right? About anti competitive practices. Should a business do it? No? Uh, Microsoft. Know that one? Know that? Microsoft. Yeah. Heard of it before? Just checking. You're all Apple people, so I don't know. All right? One of the things Microsoft got into trouble for was its operating system, which it included on its computers that it sold. Yeah? So people therefore just went, oh, I'll use that one. Yeah. That got branded a monopoly practice. Right? To such an extent that there was a global survey done, not kidding you, about operating systems. And which ones did you know and which ones didn't you know? So we found the entire world. You know how I know? Because we filled it out in New Zealand. That's how I know. Yeah? And they made a law that said they weren't allowed to do that. And as soon as that happened, all of a sudden, you got the other internet browsers popping up. Yeah? Like the, the Googles with the Chromes and the Firefoxes. And the other ones. Yeah? Domination of resources. How easy is it to start up a business if you can't get the actual factors of production? Right? It's impossible to get it. Yeah? So you talk about let's let's start up our own cell phone company. Sounds a good idea. Yeah, some of the things inside your cell phones, magnets. And radioactive material, right? But the magnets themselves are derived from rare earth uh, metals. And there's only two countries in the entire world where you can get rare earth magnets and metals from the ground that I know of. That may have changed. So it's very easy to dominate the supply of that. You're the only one. It's us. Buy it from us or else. Uh, legal barriers, who has the official license to do something? Health and safety rules, Woo! lots of those. But you put them in place and businesses can't start up. You think about, you think about the, um, the street vendors. Yeah, they're all health and safety conscious, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever got food poisoning off a street vendor, have they? No, never happens. Anybody ever gone down Khao San Road in Thailand? Famous tourist trap. It's where you buy the, the um, uh, scorpions on a stick to eat. Yeah, that's my demonstration of that. Yeah. And there are other weird things that you can get. All right, snakes. From a street vendor. Yeah, I'm sure there's adequate health and safety everywhere. Right? We we went to um, Old Town in Sujo, which we now all know. Right? And we went to a restaurant there. <laughs> and I was enjoying my meal until I looked out the window. 
and I saw uh, the, 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 the cleaning crew, the, the people who wash the dishes. And what they were doing, because Old Town is split, it's on the, on the river. Yeah? And when they went there, they went down to the canal, and they scoop up the water from the canal, the little buckets, then they take the plates, and they wash them in the, while sitting on the ground. Thought, right, just wave that dry. Here we go. Next customer. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right. In case you're unaware, in Old Town, houses live along the canals as well. And what goes into the canal comes out of the houses. It's the same. Right. Then there's this big chappy here. Not this one, this one. All right. Economies of scale. All right. The idea being that by increasing the size of your business, you can save money. All right? The bigger your business gets, the less the average cost can become per unit. It's an idea of scale, which is size. Yeah? And you, you know this instinctively. Right? Uh, and you do this. You, you deal with this all the time. Nexus is a bigger school than some, but a smaller school than others. So there are some scale factors that we have that other schools don't have, and other scale factors that other schools have that we don't. Yeah? So for example, there are more students at Garden than there are here. So because there are more students, they have more classrooms. They will have yeah, more facilities, they will have more buses, they will have more, more of everything because there are more students. The scale factor allows that cost to go down. So if they want something new, it's cheaper, on average, for them to get it because of the scale. They're operating it. Whereas for us, if we want the same thing, it's going to be more expensive. Yeah. So the basketball shooting machine that I wanted, <laughs> so only 10,000 US dollars. Yeah? Probably not. But some other schools, but yeah, 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 because they've got the scale factor. Are we all right with that? The blade? Yeah. Don't turn you back on. Just going to put back on. What's in here? Have a go at one of them. Give one you like. I don't mind. Explain one. Gosh, these would make good exam questions, wouldn't they? Explain one barrier to entry and why it prevents businesses from entering a business and how a monopolist could use that in order to secure their profits. Oh, that's a really good job. That was the one I thought of. That's a really good idea. Is it, uh, is it China that's releasing the vaccine and they haven't had official proof of it? They're just saying, no, too bad. I think it's China or India, maybe. I'm not sure. And they're releasing a vaccine that hasn't received the official approval. Their, their equipment of the FDA. 
because they desperately keen to get the vaccine out. Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, once we've decided that all things competitive are the best, and that's where the government wants everything to go, then we're very anti-monopoly. So we as the government then need to try and figure out all of these practices, figure out what businesses are, are doing them, and try and put a stop to it. So when we were in New Zealand, this organization here, was the government's organization to police businesses with regards to the level of competition. And I always thought it had one of the best names in all of the internet, comcom.gov.nz. I think it's .gov.nz. It might actually be comcom.org. Because if it was a private company, it would be comcom.com. Right? It's the Commerce Commission in New Zealand. Fairly certain it's .gov, right? And they do, they, you know, you want to merge your business with another business, you have to get permission from the Commerce Commission. And they look at all of the, the practices of the business, they look at all of those barriers to entry and all of the other sorts of competition ideas, and they say yes or no, but they might say yes, but only if. Commerce Commission. In New Zealand, we used to get the learners to do a research project into the Commerce Commission and look at some of the cases and famous New Zealand businesses that they've dealt with and some of the de uh, decisions that they've made with regards to competition. So they get to see it because they list it all on the website. Right. Yes. So because there are no substitutes, you have to buy the product from the monopolist or don't buy it. Yeah. So therefore the price of it is going to be more, the, the demand for it is going to be more inelastic. More, it's not a necessity, we're not saying that, but you don't really have a choice. So if you're in the market for it, you, you've kind of got to buy it. And we're not saying it's perfectly inelastic. We're just saying it's more inelastic. Yeah. So therefore, if the monopolist wants to make money, if it's a more inelastic market, they just raise the price. And they can make profits. Money. Yes, insulin. Considered a necessity? Monopoly? Right. For the people who need it. Sorry? How much is it? Homogenous. Yeah. I would guess that you're you're probably looking at a product that has to be FDA approved. Yeah. Uh, by the health authority, so it would be very homogenous. It would have to be. Right? Anything, any of those medicines. Yeah. Now I, I say that, but you've also got to understand that people's value systems change. Yeah. And people's understandings and science changes and all of those sorts of things. So it might be that what you used to consider safe, now you think not safe, like lead as an additive or a preservative. Yeah? Now no. Yeah? Chlorofluorocarbons used to think were safe, now not. Yeah? So things will change. But yes, you're going to assume that they've been officially approved, therefore it's safe, therefore it's completely homogenized. That's exactly the same. It should be. 
right? That's again not counting the underground market, right? And if you're in China, you will know that there's a there's actually a a black market for vaccines, immunization treatments, medicines, pretty much everything. Yeah. Uh, even here, right? Where that people are told, because it goes out on, on the Facebook, right? yeah, goes out on the Facebook to not buy um, vitamins online unless it's from an, a source that's like a pharmacy, a registered you know, pharmacy. Because there's lots of people selling all sorts of things online, but they might be a scam. And there was one that was out the other day, it was a drink, and it was supposed to cure you of, of COVID. And the, the KKM people had to put out a big advert saying, don't buy this, it's a scam. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to finish up there for the day, but please use the blue stuff for your hands, the pink stuff for your desk. We'll pick up again on Friday. <laughs> on Friday. And otherwise, it's just Santa Land in my booth. Let's pull it up. Thanks for watching. Thank you, team. Hello.